is like your income is in direct proportion with the amount of value you provide and the amount of people you help. So your income is, is in direct proportion with the amount of value you provide and the income you help. I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that. And it's, and it's true. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle podcast, the show dedicated on providing you the how-tos of marketing and networking strategies. Here we believe in the Jim Rohn quote, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Networking with Michelle show. Today's special guest is Robin Crane. She is an expert on empowering women and money and business. And her brand new book is Make More Money, Help More People. And I can't wait for us to dive into this because one of her success stories is how she went from earning 2000 a month to over six figures in 18 months. Robin, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm awesome. So I, I read your bio and I just thought this was very interesting. How did you go from singing, performing love songs to a financial marriage counselor? Yes, it's um, it's a very interesting transition. So, um, and and not very typical. So, I actually, yeah, I was a singer songwriter, and they were cynical love songs, nonetheless. Like not even love songs. Like it'd be one thing if I was writing sweet love songs and and sweet nothings to whisper to my darling's ears. But no, I had I had a uh, dated a, a lot of um, I don't know. The guys were fine, but just I I wasn't falling in love. I had one song called Not Falling in Love. I mean, I had another song called I Don't Want You. I mean, they're very very sweet. Um, there was another one that had some swear words in it. So it was it was very entertaining and fun and and probably helped me deal with the fact that I felt like oh you know here I am getting older and and not finding love. But um, yeah, I loved the performing and that was awesome. I loved being in front of the room and changing their state and changing their emotions. And it was just a lot of fun, but I didn't really feel fulfilled. I felt like there was something missing. And so I just kind of, I don't know, I, did, I didn't see my future as being on the road and, and, and doing music as much as I love performing. I really didn't see that in my future. And I also wanted to you know settle down and meet someone as cynical as my love songs were. Um, and then I actually ended up really randomly. Um, I decided to move back. I was on the East coast and I decided to move back to California and I randomly got an interview at a financial company that I don't even know how they got my info. Like, I guess I might've posted on monster or something like that. And I got an interview and I only had one other interview um, really in my life that, you know, I kind of looked into another job, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I went into this interview, there were, I don't know, maybe 12, 10 to 12 other people there. I was like, what kind of interview is this? It was really weird. Um, and then it was more like someone presenting, but this woman who was presenting was this poised 27 year old woman who was just awesome and very engaging. And she said, you know, you have the opportunity to help people retire and send their kids to college and buy a house. And I had this thought that, wow, there's actually something noble about that. There's actually something really empowering and I could be helping people. And that is what really drove me into the financial planning world. Um, so yeah, and that was actually about a decade ago and a lot has changed since then. And there's actually, I'm looking, I don't know, that's a little bit older bio, but from there I went from 2000 to six figures in the financial planning industry by doing some money coaching stuff. And then I had a horrible year and did $500 in my coaching business after I got into the coaching side. And two years later, uh, did over 500,000 a year in that same business. So it's, it's been up and down. Um, but it keeps growing now. And now I'm helping female entrepreneurs grow their business, make more money, help more people. And that's really, um, what drives me today. Um, I appreciate your honesty going back a little bit when you were making that transition from performer to financial services, were you struggling with the imposter syndrome at any point? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, every point, Michelle. Yeah. So, I mean, I totally felt like a fraud. I mean, there was making $2,000 a month. I mean, when I got to that point, it's not like I started out of the gate making $2,000 a month, but I finally got to a point where I was kind of consistently making some money. And I remember when I found the right coach and I hired him and we were looking at our money, like by money, cause I didn't really look at it very closely before I hired this coach. And then I recognized, oh my gosh, I'm 
making $2,000 a month. And I knew I had debt, but I had more debt than I realized. And I was really embarrassed and humiliated. And I felt like a fraud and an imposter. And I felt like, who am I to tell people how to manage their money when clearly I am not very good at it. But actually I was, I wasn't bad at managing my money because, uh, one of my money types, I know we'll, we'll, we'll dive into, but it, one of my money types, my high money type is, is called a cheap chip. And Cheap Chip doesn't like to spend money. Cheap Chip is a hoarder. Cheap Chip likes to save. So I was a good saver. It's just that I really knew I could grow my business. And so I knew the there were, there was a lot of value in investing in myself and my business. So I kept taking, like, as I, in order for me to get out of the Cheap Chip mode and really, you know, have an opportunity to make more money, I did start investing in myself. And that's how I got in debt, which sounds horrible. But ultimately, the debt is what led me to be so successful because I needed to borrow that money from good old credit card companies to invest in myself. And then when I finally took the right action with the right coaches and did all that, then I, I had a lot of success. I love it. So let's talk about the money types. Um, how many are there? And can you go through those? There's 57. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that would be hilarious. We're here for two hours. And this 57th one. No, there are five, there are five money types. So the, the first money type is called spend through Sally. So since we're not on video, you can just imagine this, but I actually, when I do this in presentations and videos, I use, I use dolls to represent the money types. And the reason I do that is to make light of it because we oftentimes put ourselves in a box, you know, it's like I am. So if you're saying, you know, I am even, you know, your job, like I work with a lot of female financial advisors and they introduce themselves and you're like, what do you do? They're like, I am a financial advisor. And that puts us in a box and that comes up. Like if you're talking to someone, it like the uh, images come up and pictures and what, whatever we believe about financial advisors comes up and it could be good. It could be bad. But it, it oftentimes um, brings up, you know, some sort of, um, I don't know, some, some sort of idea about it, regardless of whether it's true or not. So same thing with money types. It's like, I don't want to put you in a box. So I use these, these dolls to represent the money type. So you look at it like, for example, Spencer of Sally is Barbie. And then you don't feel like, you know, I am Barbie. You just feel like it represents some of your beliefs, some of your behaviors, and it makes it makes light of it. So you don't have to take it so seriously and beat yourself up about it. So spend through Sally. She has the tendency to spend. She loves to spend. She loves to buy. She feels good when she buys. Um, but oftentimes she goes and spends money impulsively or compulsively to fill an emotional void. So, um, she's doing it because it makes her feel good emotionally in the moment, but then later maybe she feels guilty. Maybe she's like, why did I buy this? Beats herself up. Um, and oftentimes it's not always the case, but a lot of times spent through Sally's are in debt because they make these, you know, very quick impulsive decisions and they're not necessarily looking at the consequences. Um, so that's spent through Sally. You want me to keep going through all five? Um, if you just name them off with a short blurb. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So cheap chip, which I mentioned, um, that's my number one money type go cheap chip. Woo. Uh, so cheap chip does not like to spend money represented by Ken, by the way, does not like to spend money. Um, and he, he hoards money and loves to save. And when he does spend, it doesn't feel good. Like if I, I mean, when I was really, really in scarcity mode and I've changed a lot since back then, I mean, it's a lot different when you start, you know, taking risks and stepping into some of the other money types so that you can actually be more successful. Because the problem with cheap chip is that he's so scarcity minded that he doesn't tend to make a lot of money because he's always thinking about saving a buck and not very abundance driven, which kind of prevents him from selling well or making good money. So, um, so I was good at saving, but I was not good at making money versus spend through Sally, who tends to be good at sales because she actually doesn't understand why anyone would ever wait to buy. Like, why would you wait? You could just make a quick decision <laughs> versus cheap chip. who was like, oh no, I need to research this. I need to think about it. I need to compare prices. I need to find the best deal. So cheap chip loves a good deal. Spend through Sally also loves a good deal, but it's, it's different. Like she just wants to, you know, if she goes to, to the store and buys a dress and she sees the $500 dress that she can get for a hundred dollars, she'll go brag that she saved $400. Like she's still thinking I say $400 and disregards the fact that she spent a hundred bucks that she, when she didn't even need the dress and she shouldn't have spent the money. 
versus cheap chip. We'll agonize about that, but it's $400 off. I love a good deal. Okay. I'll buy it. But then he still feels like, Oh man, I spent a hundred dollars. You know, it still feels like that's a hundred dollars out of my pocket. So obviously they're not, uh, I use different genders just for fun, but you know, I'm a cheap, you can say, you know, uh, cheap Chelsea, if you want, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, then there's over generous Olivia over generous Olivia. I have like a little doll who kind of like she has this huge oversized t-shirt on and, and it represents the fact that she's always giving up everything at her expense. So like she gives away her clothes, she's wearing hand-me-downs, God forbid she'll buy anything nice for herself, but then she'll spend money on other people in business. You oftentimes see, uh, over generous Olivia is giving a ton of time away for free. They're, um, oftentimes undervaluing themselves or having lower prices. You know, they'll, they, they'll charge less because they, they think they need to give their, give so much. And if anyone needs help, you know, they, they want to make sure they get the help. So, um, maybe they'll put their kids first, they'll put others first and it's usually at their expense. So it oftentimes hurts their business. Um, then we have delusional Dan delusional Dan thinks big. Anything is possible. Yes. I only made 30 grand last year, but of course I can make a million dollars next year. So it's like you have these ideas of grandeur. You think anything is possible. You can do it. You're willing to take risks, but you also have the shiny penny syndrome, right? Or the squirrel, right? That you get very, very distracted by things and lack focus. So true delusional dance, if they're in the negative side, meaning that they're, you know, characteristically like getting distracted or, um, not focused. They oftentimes have like, they're, they're like, Oh, well I have, you know, you're like, you're like, what's, what's your business or what's your job? And there's like five of them, you know, they're not really doing that great in all of them because they're so like, they're, they're spread too thin, but then you can get a delusional Dan, like Tony Robbins, who follows through with everything. And he really literally went from $38,000 a year to over one, 1 million. I think it was 1.1 million the following year. So you got to be delusional to do that. So you can make a lot of money as a delusional Dan, as long as you follow through and you stick to the plan. And then the last one is avoider Al and avoider Al wants to avoid anything that feels remotely like, you know, scary or that feels like it's going to make him feel bad. Like it just wants to avoid any confrontation. If you, if you're in debt, don't look at it. If you're spending a lot of money, don't look at it. If you're, you know, if your job, let's say you think you might get fired, you don't want to see the truth. Like do not face the truth. He buries his head in the sand and he's represented by, um, a doll that has just like, he's not wearing a shirt, but I think that was just because my daughter didn't have a shirt for him. Uh, but he has like a, you know, little thing over his eyes, like he's blind. And I usually put him in the driver's seat just to be funny. But, oh, and I forgot to say delusional Dan is represented by, um, the Justin Bieber doll, but it's like Justin Bieber. And then I hold up another dweeby doll and I say, he thinks he looks like this, but actually he looks like this. And I show like a little dorky doll and that's the delusional part. So they're really fun, but if you look at them and you look at it seriously, um, I'll give away, I'll I'll give you a link that everybody can go to to download it. Um, but you want to look at how it's holding you back. So I can focus all day long on how great it is to be a cheap chip and delusional Dan. But if I just focus on that, then I can't grow. I can't get to where I want to be because there's always another level. So if instead you can see how it might be holding you back, and that's what I did 10 years ago, realizing how scarcity minded I was and how much I was just so focused on not wanting to spend that it was really hurting my business, so afraid to take risks that it was totally hurting my business. Um, So I finally stepped into delusional Dan, which I had a tendency to do anyway, took more risks. And then I just had, once I followed through and I had the right coach, then it all started to come together. So you can really step into these and have fun with them and be conscious of, you know, what, what patterns you're running so that you can use it to your advantage. I love it. Cause I feel like I've gone through all of these split personalities, no money types <laughs> through, through my career. And, um, I actually just finished a coaching program. So this would be interesting, uh, to see if this delusional Dan can play out over the next couple of months. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you really need, sometimes you really need delusional Dan really. So delusional Dan, even Spencer or Sally, like uh, a lot of times they're good when growing your business. It's just, it's mostly the follow through and even spend for Sally. If you, if you start spending money in the sense of you do it to, for example, for convenience or like, I'm definitely more in like, I, I've been become more of a spend through Sally in the sense of that. I always hire people to help me because it's a shortcut, right? So it's a smart way to spend money. But what you want to do is look at your ROI. You want to see your return on your investment because most, most of the times it, it will be more to fill that emotional need, right? So if you are like, Oh, I need to, 
I need to get a really nice website. And it's going to be like, so many, like if you're working right now and you're in the corporate world, right. And you're thinking about starting a business, many people think they need to create, I need a website. I need this, all these things. I need a logo. I need like whatever, just go get a client. Like you can talk to people with your mouth without any sort of logo or branding and get a client. And then you can start building that stuff. But sometimes, you know, if you build all that stuff first, you're just pimping your ride. And that's kind of a Spencer or Sally thing to do versus cheap chip would be like, hell no, am I spending money on that? Like I'll buy, get a website that just says my name on Weebly or something and spend nothing because I don't have any money yet. Like, why would I spend money before I have it? You know, so you just got to be really conscious of those and make those conscious decisions because every decision affects your business and affects your life. Yeah. I love the breakdown. Now I know now, um, and I'm probably going to mess up this quote, but it's something like, you know, the more people you impact, it's going to, it's equivalent or it's going to resonate to your income. Right. Um, yeah. so with your title, make more money, help more people, like how important is that impact and that value add? And I think a lot of times people are struggling to figure out. Like I help people all the time, but am I helping them enough in order for me to actually make a decent living? Right. So yeah, in my view, and I'm sure I didn't make this up. I probably heard it somewhere similar to what you said is, is like your income is in direct proportion with the amount of value you provide and the amount of people you help. So your income is, is in direct proportion with the amount of value you provide and the income you help. I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that. And it's, and it's true. Um, and even, I mean, it's, I, I say this in my book, I want to be very clear because I'm, I'm not, I'm really talking to business owners here more than anything. And it's somewhat true in the, in, in the corporate world as well. I wouldn't know. I was never in the corporate world, but, um, but it's like, I have friends who are teachers. I'm not saying, Oh, well you must not provide any value because you don't make any money. So that is not always the case in, in the, in, in the salary world. So I just want to make that clear because you know, for sure, like teachers are providing some of the most value on this planet, um, by teaching kids who are the next generation. Um, but when it comes to your business, I mean, you, it really is an exchange, right? People will only pay as much money as they believe the value is worth. So, um, it was really interesting. I was talking to this woman, I actually had an event last night and she came as well and she was really awesome and open. And I, let me tell her story, but, um, I was talking, talking to her the other day, the day before the event. And she, I said, you have to come to the event because she said, well, I'm here, I'm an event planner and I'm kind of starting a business. And I said, well, what's holding you back? And her number one thing was capital. And I said, okay, so you feel like capital is holding you back. So if you had capital, like you feel like you can grow your business. And that was kind of the experience she was having, which is BS. I'm just, I called her on and I said, you know, like I, I grew my business without capital. I mean, yes, I did use credit cards. Thank you, credit cards. But really it's not about the resources that you have. It's about the resourcefulness as so many people. I mean, you can look at billionaires, how much money did they have? Of course you get some, you know, people in the world who had a handout, but most of the billionaires in the world actually made it without anything. They were just very resourceful. So it's never about the capital. It's always about you, you, you finding a way and it's about your commitment and about, um, how resourceful you can be. But anyway, her second problem was that she didn't know what the competition was charging. And she thought that was like, that's what was holding her back. And I said, well, like kind of to me, I'm thinking, what's the relevance of that? Cause I don't care about my competition. I just provide, like I'll charge what I believe. Like if I charge $10,000 for something and I give them $50,000 of value or millions, like I've worked with clients and one of my clients, she made $6 million after working with me. Like I was like, gosh, I should have charged a million bucks. What was I thinking? You know? But I mean, really like, I mean, she was kind of hooked for life. Now she's my one-on-one client because I gave her so much value. So it really is about the value you provide. But anyway, so she, she said, um, I'm looking, you know, I, she says, I feel like I need to know my competition's prices first before I decide my price. And that was what was holding her back. And I said, okay, well let's pretend like, let's say that someone was charging $2,000 for event planning, right? How much would you charge? And she said, well, I'd probably charge a little less than that. So 1700. I said, okay, what if someone was charging $5,000? And she said, I'd probably the same, like a few hundred less, I'd charge 4,700. I said, what if they were charging $300? She said, oh, well, 150. So like to me, that seemed ridiculous, but to her, it like made so much sense. And I was like, so why is it that someone else who's providing some service that like, gets to determine 
what you charge. Like, why would you? So I'm telling you, there are people who are charging $2,000 who do exactly what you could do. There are people who are charging $5,000 who are doing exactly what you could do. There are people charging $500 or $300 doing exactly what you could do. So why don't you just decide that if you're going to charge $2,000, you make sure you give at least four, six, ten thousand dollars $10,000 worth of value. And you just have to be congruent with that. Now you need systems, you need a mentor, you need to be able to follow through with that because if you don't have the conviction, if you don't have the confidence to do that, if you don't have a sales process, if you're missing all the business tools, then it's going to be tough to do that. But um, if you have all those things, like it's really irrelevant. One of my clients, sorry, I'm, I'm going off here. I'll say one more thing and <laughs> can't help myself. Um, yes, very good questions. So one of my clients, uh, I talk about her all the time because she just blew me away. She was making negative $300 a month. She was a financial advisor. And then, um, we had at one conversation, she decided to leave her financial advisor job and, and become a money coach because she really liked the coaching aspect more. And she had kind of done some research with me knowing that I was a money coach and now a business coach coach and she knew she could model some stuff and she knew it was possible because I already did it. So, um, she basically started in the first three months, she made $10,000. So for her, after not making money for three years, making $10,000 in her new business in the first three months was phenomenal. And she started charging 500 bucks. And then I remember the first time she came to the, to an event, like her first event, she said, well, I have this person who I know she doesn't have very much money and I'm going to charge her $500, but you know, what should I do? And I said, just make another package. It's 1500 bucks and let her decide. You don't decide Let her decide. And I, and I said, just make it more valuable. It's got to be way more valuable than what you would give her for 500 bucks. So I said, what can you give her for 1500 that will be more transformational and more sustainable in her life? So she came up with something and she did not believe that she would get this client for 1500 bucks. She's like, this woman does not have money. How is she going to come up with the money? Like, it's just not going to happen. And then she went back and she just offered both and did a lot of shutting up, which is very important in sales. And guess what the woman chose? The $1,500, you got it, right? The $1,500 package because people want transformation. They don't want something that's not going to work. It's more expensive to spend $500 on something that doesn't get me the result than spend $10,000 on something that gets me the result. So this is someone who then continued to raise her price. Now she charges $9,000. This is only 10 months later, $9,000 for her one-on-one. And she's now made $85,000 in the last 10 months. And as you can tell, if you do the math, if you subtract out three months, right, that means in the last seven months, she made $75,000, totally exponential. She's had $20,000 a month. This is someone who didn't make money for three years. What changed for her? Like a few things, her beliefs, right? She, I have this thing called the belief loan phenomenon, um, but she borrowed my beliefs and the community's beliefs. She took the action and she got the result and she kept taking action, you know? And so it wasn't because of what other people charged. It was because of what she believed and what, uh, and it's not even what the market could bear. It was what, the, what value she provided. Mm. Yeah. I love it. Make it more valuable and let the customer decide and get yeah. to the transformation. Okay. Before we wrap up, I have two more questions. Um, the first one is though, what are, I want you to tell us this. What are the two questions we need to ask ourselves about money? In what, in what respect? Because there's a lot of questions I can come up with, but in what respect, like in regards to money and business making money or in regards to growing money? Cause those are two very different things, growing money, keeping money, the more the financial planning side or earning money making money. That's the first question uh, from your question. <laughs> Make that. No, that's great. Thank you. Making money in business. Okay. So what's the first question? I would say my first question would be, who do you want to help? Who do you want to help? Because the only way to help, like to make money is to help people. That's it. It's an exchange of value, right? So who do you want to help? I was bragging last night at my event because I had, um, it was a small event. I had about, uh, 20, 20 to 25 women there. And five of them were clients, either existing femmes, this femme is my mentorship, female empowered money makers. But these women who are either in my program or were in my program, you know, were, were there. And many of them, some of them traveled five hours to be at this four hour event and who had already spent six months with me. And you'd be like, why would they come back? You must really have not given them any value. No, it was because, you know, they can just, they, they joked about getting a dose of Robin, right? They needed to be back in the environment. They needed to be back where they can get motivated again. Right. But anyway, um, so I was, I, I was bragging about how much I love my clients. I'm like, these ladies, I just love 
love them. We're just disgusting. We're like, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. It's like, it's ridiculous, but it's like, we really genuinely love each other. Like one of them who drove up, she saw me and she's like, hi, I love you. Hi, I love you. And I'm like, oh God, we're going to disgust everyone around us. But the reason I say that is because you're going to work a lot and you better love your job, but you better love the people that you're serving. And what's going to motivate you to serve them at a higher level is that you freaking love them. You genuinely love them and you want them to get the best results they can possibly get. And if you have that intention, they will like to pay you money. I, I can't tell you enough. Like Lisa, Bree, like these women were saying, Robin, I can't wait to pay you more. Like what the, who says that? Who wants that? But they do because they get so much value and they know when they pay me more, they pay more attention. I pay more attention. And then they 10 times their money or something like it's just insane. So one, who do you want to help? That's most important. And then number two, cause that's the only way you're going to make money, right? So number two about making money, I would say, Hmm. Let me think about this. Number two, gosh, I can give you 10. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, number two, I'd say, um, learn business skills. That would be number two, because if you are actually good at whatever you're good at, so if you decide to go into business or you're in a business, or you're starting a business and you're like, I'm good at coaching or I'm good at accounting or bookkeeping, or I'm good at financial planning or whatever you think the way you want to help someone, that's, that's awesome. Um, but just because you're good at the craft, I talk about this in my book, like I went to do, I became a singer songwriter. And what did I do? I got guitar lessons. I got voice lessons. I learned how to sing. I learned how to write. I learned how to play the guitar. I didn't learn the business. And so I was broke as shit. Like I wasn't making money. Right. So, I mean, you have to learn the business. Like you have to actually spend as much effort, time and money on the business side because you can be the best coach, the best accountant, the best financial planner, the best, uh, event planner in the world and make zip zilch nothing. If you don't have business skills and tools, you got to learn those business skills and tools and like have a mentor to help you get the shortcut. So absolutely learn the business skills and tools with a mentor who has, has gotten the results that you want and who is getting other people like you, the results that you want. I kind of cheated and combined one, two into one. <laughs> um, the book, make more money, help more people. Look, the first person that emails me, I'm going to go ahead and buy them a copy of the book because I know it's a value add as is. But uh, Robin, how can people get in touch with you? You know what? That is awesome. Okay. I'm going to give you two things. So one, you can get that money type quiz. Okay. Cause I want you guys to get that and you, and you know, you'll get these videos, like they're two minute videos about each money type. So you can at least learn how, it, how it might be affecting you and your life and your business and your money. But you go to robincrane.com, R O B Y N C R A N E.com forward slash money type quiz robincrane.com forward slash money type quiz. You can take the quiz. You'll get your results immediately. You'll get an email with the, the videos or you'll get uh, redirected to the videos and that'll be awesome. And then the other thing, awesome. You're going to buy someone a book. That's really nice of you. It better to have the book in hand so you can use it over and over again. I, I like to have physical copy, but I want to give everyone the book because I'm so passionate about it. And I really believe that it will help you. And as you can tell, I'm passionate about what I do and I love helping people. So I want to give you the book as well. You can go to robincrane.com forward slash free book and you'll get the download. You'll get to not only download the book, even if you get, if you win the free copy, you can also, um, get the bonuses. So you might want to sign up for that anyway. You can get bonuses. There's like two chapters of the audiobook, which is all I've ever, I've done. Um, but there's a, there's videos, there's a webinar. I mean, I, I can't give you more stuff. Like you'll get a little sick of me giving you so much value, but if you use it, you'll actually make more money and help more people. I uh, love it. I love it. I love it. And we're going to have, um, her website, Robin's website in the show notes. Um, before the last and final question, Robin, how do you define success? You've had a great journey. How do you define success? I define it as really fulfillment. I mean, I think success means to me that I'm fulfilled doing what I love. And, and I do believe getting paid for that value, you know, but I think people can be successful without getting paid. I don't think you definitely have to make the money, but there's gotta be some sort of value exchange, you know, and I feel like I'm successful when I'm helping people. I'm successful when I'm making a difference. I'm successful when I'm changing lives and transforming, um, like people's businesses and their life. Like it just, it feels so good. Like I can sit here if I, if I really focus on it and just cry out of gratitude of how grateful I am and how, how amazingly fulfilled I feel because I'm now helping others make more money and help more people because it's just, it, it's incredible. That makes me feel successful. And I, I mentioned this in my book, but, um, 
like as far as the financial success is, I, I said, there's a part in my book where I said, there's no amount of money or, or no, I didn't say that. I said, there's, I said, I feel, I feel like I never have to worry about money again, not because of the amount of money in my bank account. It's because I know that, you know, no market crash, you know, no economy change, no present, nothing in the external world can affect my value. Now that I know who I help and how I help them, I can always make money. So it doesn't matter if I went bankrupt tomorrow, not going to happen, but if I did, if I did, I wouldn't be worried about money because I know my values there. I can always do another seminar. I can always reach out to people again. I can always find a way. So when you get to that point, that's success. Like that is such success. We have so much value to offer the world that, you know, someone out there will always pay for it. You never have to worry about money again. And you've reached true success. Ah, I love it. Knowing how to make money, having the ability to go out there and to make the money. I love it. Hey, everyone. Remember, I believe in you. Personal connection leads to an influential network. Thanks for networking with Michelle.